Okay, for this one, we're going to go through creating shear and bending moment diagrams from a distributed load. So how you go about doing this, we're going to take a chunk from the system and analyze the forces on this chunk. And by the end of it, you'll see where the calculus falls out of this piece. So for any engineering system, divide it into pieces. And you can look at the forces and moments on any little piece of it. The patterns for one piece, it's the pattern through the whole structure. So we'll pull this little chunk out here and start looking at the forces on it. This little piece of beam here, so there's a chunk of distributed load on it. This could be a pile of sand, a pile of snow or something. And you can take that small little element, change in X, and multiply it. So this is a kind of a two-dimensional load curve. You have force divided by a length. So to turn force divided by a length, it's kind of like pressure, PSI, only instead of pounds per area, it is a force divided by length. So we're going to multiply that by the length here, and that's going to give us the force. And the force for that element is going to act halfway through that little sliver of material. So we have this dx, dx over two, with a piece of distributed load acting on the top of it. Okay, on either side of this, we have the shear forces holding it up. And so you can kind of think through, okay, here's the side of here, and we've got the ground is holding it up, and, and then part of that distributed load, that'll act in the middle, and we have, you know, the beam, what kind of internal force, and whatever is on one side of that cut, it's going to be equal and opposite on the other side. So let's draw that shear force acting up on the left. And then on the other side of it, it's going to be slightly, slightly different, right? Because we also have to add this in. So if I look at just adding together the Y forces, the Y forces on this little element, I have my starting shear over here on the left-hand side. I have some piece of that distributed load pushing down in the middle. And then over on this other side, there's a little bit more shear because it's having to balance this extra load on there. Okay, so if you walk through the forces in the Y direction, a bit of this is going to cancel out. What you end up with is the change in shear happening on this is going to be the area underneath that load curve. So this turns into an integral. Instead of delta x, we have dx. And you can get how that shear is changing from, from one side of this element to the other. Moving from the internal shear to the internal bending moment. So again, we're going to start with one moment on one side of this thing. By the time we get to the other side of the element, that internal moment is going to have changed some little bit over here. So let's, instead of adding together the forces on this, let's go ahead and add together the moment and see how the moment changes through each little element. So we have the moment on one side, and it's going to be going the opposite direction on the other side. So we can have a little sign change over there. Those guys are going to cancel one another out. And we're left with that the change in moment happening through this little element. And this is going to be a function of, so if I take the moment around this right-hand side, I'm going halfway through the element to omega del delta x, and then I'm going to full way through the element to my shear on the one side. As delta x goes to zero, so we're dealing with very small little slivers here, this little guy is going to go to zero. And we are left with, now the moment is the area underneath the shear curve. So moment R cross F, we have a distance times a force. So it kind of makes sense. Okay, there's a synopsis of all of this stuff. So these equations come from 
carving the system up into a very small element, looking at the forces and the moments acting on that very small element. So, and that's the magic of free body diagrams. You can carve out any little piece of any system you want, analyze one atom, analyze the big picture. You can, it's a game of, of carving these things up. Okay, let's walk through a very simple example. Let's say we have a pile of bricks. So this load curve and omega is going to be just some constant value, right? So omega could be equal to something like, I don't know, 10 pounds per foot. So this it has units of force divided by length. So if I want to turn this distributed load of a big pile of bricks to just one concentrated force, the, the magnitude of that force, I'm going to take that 10 pounds per foot. If I multiply this by a length, right, some, some length and feet, the feet cancel out, and then I am left with a force, and in this case, it's going to act right in the middle. So that's the center of mass of this object would be right in the middle. From that first step, we can then solve for what reactions are happening at the legs. So in this case, since it's symmetrical, half of that load is going to be held up by each side. And this is the first step in all these problems is you're going to have to figure out what is happening over here at those external supports. That's your boundary condition. It's going to determine integration constants to see kind of where you're starting on this thing. Okay, once we have what's happening at the edge, the next piece of this is to kind of carve it through and start thinking about what's happening as we walk through the beam. So let's go ahead and define a coordinate system here. So we'll just measure the distance from the end of this thing and call that the distance x. And as we walk through it, our shear is going to have to balance all these y forces. So we have omega l over 2 at the end. And then as we get farther and farther into it, this distributed load on the top is getting larger and larger until halfway through it will cancel out what is happening at the edge here. Just a quick reminder for sign conventions, positive internal shear is, goes down on the left hand side and up. You have equal and opposite forces on each side of that cut and so it's just a kind of an industry standard that it sort of goes along with the sign of your moment. So if you have counterclockwise moment is positive, they are calling shear going down on this side positive or up on this side. So when you see those, those shear and bending moment diagrams, if you draw the free body diagram, this is going down, but on the graph, it's positive on the graph, it's positive. Okay, so here we go. We're going to graph out how this internal shear is changing as we walk through this beam. And we're going to do that by adding together just these forces in the y direction. So we've got the shear acting in the positive direction over here. And it is kind of balancing this little guy over here. And I know the signs look weird. And in between those two, we have some piece of that load curve. If this was an entire equation instead of just a number, you could integrate the whole equation for whatever distance this is acting over. Here is an example worked out in Mathematica. So I have shear over here acting at the edge. You kind of have to have that, that boundary condition figured out. And then this piece of it, that is the distributed load. And however far into the beam that distributed load is acting. So if you go ahead and, and plot this out, what you get is this would be the, the shear diagram for what's happening inside of that beam. You'll notice that at the very middle, my shear is zero 
And that is because this is symmetrical. So if I have half the load over here and then half of the load, it's already balanced, then there's nothing left to balance in the middle at that point. And you'll get to the maximum shear here is at the very edge. And that ends up being the same as the support at the edge. So if you're looking at kind of the very edge, you're just barely starting to walk through it and you have some big support at the edge, the shear at the edge, that's going to be the maximum for this one. Okay, moving along, what we have is the bending moment piece of this. So in addition to a shear force, we also have this bending moment force. For this case, we're going to call the moment at the end zero, so we won't have to worry about that boundary condition. That makes this a lot easier. And we're going to take the equation we got for our shear, that nice linear line, and we're going to put that into our bending moment. So moment is the area under the shear curve, and all you have to do is just crank through that integration and you can see what the bending moment is. So here's our, our integration. You can see how that turns out. So L omega over two, you add an X to that. X omega goes to X squared. So you see this one, this one is an X squared. It's no longer linear. And we end up with this, this nice bending moment diagram. And right here in the middle, that is where this thing is going to break. You're usually interested to see where the thing is going to break. And because this is symmetrical, what we can do is just plug in the center length for this, or you can think of it's where the slope goes to zero. So if the slope of this thing goes to zero, figure out what position that slope goes to zero, and that's going to be where your max moment happens. So here's a synopsis of those guys. So you're going to first find the reaction to support. And then once you have the support reactions, you can use that to figure out the shear at any point. So the reaction plus the area under the load curve is going to give you your shear. And then you're going to take that shear equation, plug it in. The area under your shear curve is your moment. So very handy, and you can do this with any equation, any pile of snow that you want. Um, for the homework, I gave you another nice symmetrical scenario, so you don't have to do anything strange to figure out what's happening at the supports. This is different than your homework, so this is just throwing some numbers in here. So if you have a sine curve, you can find the area under the curve is going to give you your total load. So I just took... The equation describing that load curve. I went zero all the way to the other side. So the force, the equivalent concentrated load for this one is 30. So that means that half and half of it are on each side, symmetrical. And if it wasn't symmetrical, you'd go through a center of mass calculation. So we've done that center mass stuff too, and it would just be a little bit more of a pain to solve for it. So once you have these reactions at the edges, the next part of this, so here's the total load, the shear, and I'm grabbing that little reaction at the edge. So half of that force is held up by both sides. And something kind of interesting here is that the um, kind of the integration constants, this is pretty much zero, negative six is zero. The integration constants cancel out with that half of a load. And so you end up with just, yeah, the sine point 2x goes to the, yeah, cosine. You don't really have to worry about the, the integration constants for this one. So very nice. But this is, and this is hopefully very similar looking to what we had before. So the only difference now is instead of having a linear shear curve, it is no longer linear, it's now part of a cosine curve, but you see the same sort of trend where we're starting with a positive shear. So as we're walking through this, this beam,
We have the, the end is getting held up, the shear, and this is a positive, this is a positive shear. It's just kind of a, one of those weird sign conventions. So it starts positive, it's symmetrical, so it is zero in the middle, same kind of idea, it's zero in the middle, and we're starting with some positive value, and that value is what was happening at the supports over there. If we take this equation for our shear, pop it into our moment calculations, so there's our moment curve. Again, because the moment is zero at the ends, and we'll say that this beam has a pin support over here, so that means the moment needs to add to zero there. So that very much simplifies it, so we don't have to worry about those integration constants. And we have the maximum moment happening right in the center. You can see where the slope goes to zero. So if you kind of solve for what is happening at the center, we end up over here with 75. So I'm just plugging in x is equal to L over 2, and then you can, you can figure out what the maximum moment is for this one. Okay, so... That is shear and bending moment diagrams for beams that have distributed loads on top of them. A little bit of calculus for this thing, but the big equations to remember for this is just that the change in shear is going to be the area under your load curve, and the change in moment is the area under your shear curve. So these two guys, and they come from free body diagram of just a little element of your beam.